So, uh, we are in the midst of a series of sermons based on the Apostles' Creed, which we just sang a version of since Easter, the week after Easter, going through, I don't know, about the middle, third week of July. We're going to be going line by line through this creed that confessions have been, um, that Christians have been using across the continents, across the centuries. And so before we begin, I'm going to invite you to stand and we are going to recite the creed together. So Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Very good. And you go ahead and have a seat. So, Pilate. Pilate was a member of the Pontius family, collectively known as the Ponti. His family came from a region in central Italy known as the Samnium, a region that originally was sort of opposed to the coup of Julius Caesar, opposed to the idea of an emperor. It was a region uh, with a military tradition, a lot of soldiers. But by the time Pilate came of age... His family was thoroughly Roman and assimilated into the empire. They were considered to be among the upper class of Roman elite. Or, as I understand it, the, the, the top level of Roman culture would be the senators, and then the next level down were called equestrians, and that's where the Ponti fit, the Pontius family. It's likely that Pilate became a soldier at an early age. Now, Advancement in Roman society depended on patronage. Then, as now, it wasn't so much what you knew as who you knew. And uh, Pilate had a powerful sponsor and a man named Sejanus. Sejanus was the commander of the emperor's personal guard. And through his influence, Pilate was appointed prefect or governor of Judea in the year 26. Pilate was the fifth person to hold this title, the fifth prefect. As prefect, his main responsibilities were to command the Roman soldiers in the region, which numbered about 3,000, to collect the Roman taxes, to supervise Roman building projects, and then to serve as the supreme judge, the final authority in all disputes. History indicates that Sejanus, his patron, was opposed to the Roman policy of accommodating the religious views of the Jews. For most of the empire... Uh, wherever Rome went after they'd conquered a people, the, the basic procedure was to, to convert the people to a Jewish way of thinking, to worshiping Jewish gods, to using Jewish, or Roman, excuse me, Roman gods, using Roman currency. But Israel was an exception because the Jews had such a strong belief, what the Romans, Romans found kind of an unusually strong belief in their God, most of the Romans found it easier to allow the Jews to worship as they saw fit and just sort of to tolerate it. But Sejanus was opposed to that policy. As far as he was concerned, everybody else in the empire could convert. The Jews could as well. And so Pilate, who was a protege of Sejanus, when Pilate enters Israel, it's not surprising that he took a policy that was opposed to this Jewish religious practice. And so shortly after Pilate moves into his new quarters in Jerusalem, he has his Roman soldiers march through Jerusalem, flying banners that have an image of the emperor on them, which would be a direct contradiction to the Jewish opposition to images of any sort. And so here here are Roman soldiers marching through the most holy city of Israel, flying these banners with with pictures of the emperor on them. And, And so the Jews come out, they gather around Pilate's um, courtyard in protest, and Pilate brings the soldiers out and surrounds surrounds this crowd with his soldiers. The soldiers draw their sword, and and, and frankly, history says Pilate was uh, surprised 
at the strength of feeling among the Israelites, so much so that, that one historian says that when the Roman soldiers drew their swords, the Jews presented their necks. They, they bared their necks to the sword. Now, this is basically Pilate's first day on the job. He doesn't really need a riot his first day on the job, and so he caved. He took the banners down. Uh, he sent the people away peacefully. But on other occasions, Pilate was not so reasonable. On another occasion, when the Jews protested his use of the temple treasury to fund an aqueduct building project, basically plumbing, Pilate ordered his soldiers this time not to surround the crowd, but to infiltrate them wearing civilian garb. And so as the protests grew, the soldiers sort of mixed among the people with clubs under their robes. And then at a prearranged signal, they drew their clubs and began to beat the protesters, killing several of them, injuring many more. It's possible that Luke 13, 1, where it talks about Pilate mixing the blood of the Gentiles with their sacrifices, is a reference to this very incident. One ancient historian, a man named Philo of Alexandria, describes Pilate as a man of inflexible, stubborn, and cruel disposition. Philo says he was a spiteful and angry person. He was no friend of the people he governed. In the year 31, however, things changed. The emperor Tiberius ordered the execution of Pilate's sponsor, Sejanus. And it appears Tiberius had a much more sympathetic view towards Jewish religious practices than Sejanus did. So Pilate now finds himself in a tenuous political position. His sponsor back in Rome is no longer there. The emperor wants him to uh, cool it with his oppression of the Jews. It's a testimony to Pilate's political instinct for self-preservation that he managed to hold on to his position for another five years. In the year 36, however, the Jews complained once again at his excessive use of force in quelling a religious disturbance in Samaria, and the emperor ordered him to return to Rome. While en route, however, the emperor Tiberius died before Pilate could get to Rome. Caligula took the throne, and at that point... Pilate disappears from the pages of history. We're not certain whether Caligula just allowed him to retire peacefully, maybe sent him off into exile somewhere, or some speculation is out there that perhaps Pilate committed suicide. At any rate, what's known for certain is that he was not allowed to return to his post in Judea. Now, everything I just told you about Pilate comes from non-biblical sources. That is, we know quite a bit about Pilate from the historian Philo, whom I mentioned, from the Jewish historian Josephus, and even he gets mentioned in the Roman historian of T Roman history written by Tacitus. We even have a rock with his name on it. In 1961, archaeologists working in the area around Caesarea Philippi uncovered a rock that reads, This building, the Tiberium, by Pontius Pilate, was built. Speculated that Pilate, being the political suck-up that he was, built a temple and used this as a cornerstone dedicated to the emperor Tiberius. So all in all, we have quite a bit of information about someone who was essentially a mid-level bureaucrat who lived 2,000 years ago. As one commentator I read this week said, it's not like he was the governor of Texas, it was more like he was the governor of North Dakota which is kind of a shot at North Dakota, but, kind of, but also kind of gets across the point that he was, you know, he's not the kind of people who normally show up in the history books, and yet there's, there's a good amount of information about Pilate. We know he was the fifth prefect to govern in Judea. We know the years he was there, 26 to 36, we know he was a very real person. And of course, his name shows up in the Apostles' Creed. Now think about that. The Creed's not very long. Our English translation of the Creed is 114 words. And yet two of those words are used to name Pontius Pilate. Which raises an obvious question. Why does this name show up in the Creed? Why does this cruel, vicious, political sycophant get a place in our confession of faith? This is one of the most important documents in Christianity. Outside of the Bible, you could argue this is one of our most important pieces of writing. And yet, here's this mid-level Roman governor showing up in our creed. 
Why doesn't the creed just say Jesus was crucified, that, that Jesus suffered, was crucified, died, and was buried? doesn't need to name Pontius Pilate. You still get the point across if you skip his name. So why mention Pilate? And here, I believe, is the answer. Pontius Pilate anchors the story of Jesus in history. The name of Pilate reminds us that Jesus was a real person who lived in a real place and time, who interacted with real people outside the religious realm of legend and myth. By naming Pilate, the creed is reminding us that the gospel is not just about ideas. The gospel is about God acting and continuing to act in the world of history. You see, some people might not think the historicity of Jesus matters. There's an idea out there that it's the story that counts. One view of religion, this kind of comes from the world of philosophy, but one, one view of religion is that every culture has its formative myths, right? These philosophers look at all the cultures of the world and they say, well, every culture has these myths, these, these stories that, that, that sort of shape their behavior and their identity. So there are Native American myths and the Greeks have their myths about the Greek gods and, and, and you go to an island in the Pacific and they'll tell you stories about how the, their island came to be. So every culture has the, their, their myth, these formative myths. And so the the philosophers say about religion is that it doesn't really matter if those stories are true or not. What, what's important is the way these stories shape and create identity in people. And so it's the story that counts. In fact, this is how some of those people I talked about last week can continue to call themselves Christians. Remember last week I talked about the modernists, the people who don't believe in the virgin birth, don't believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, basically don't believe any of the miracles described in the gospel actually happened. And you, you look at them and you say, well, what, why do you call yourself a Christian? You know, if you don't believe God did any of those things, why, why bother? And they'll tell you, well, the stories. They'll say the stories are still important. The, the stories still tell us something about how, how life works and how to behave. And so it's the story that matters. To which the creed says, nonsense. The creed, by including Pilate, is saying, look, this really happened. This is God at work in the world. This isn't just a nice idea. This isn't just a salvation myth. This is history. So what I want to do today is I want to look real quickly at the story of Pilate in the Bible I want us to see how the Bible portrays him, how that matches up with what we can learn from the history books. And for that, we'll look at Matthew chapter 27. And then after I say a few things about that, I want to give you three reasons the historicity of this story is important. Three reasons we should care that Jesus suffered in history under Pontius Pilate. And for that, then, I'll touch on several other passages of Scripture as well. So first, let's look at the story of Pilate in Scripture. Pilate's story, of course, is told in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So for our purposes, we'll just look at the version from Matthew, Matthew 27, starting at verse 11. It says, Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You've said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. And one of the things that's clear in the story of Pilate and Jesus is this was not a problem Pilate wanted. See, if Jesus had truly been calling himself the king of the Jews in a political sense, if Jesus had truly been rallying people to arms in order to lead a revolt against Rome, if that had been happening, if Pilate had believed that had been happening, this would have been a shut and dry case. He would have had Jesus executed and wouldn't have bothered him a bit. But clearly, Pilate doesn't believe that's what's happening here. Pilate feels as though he's been sucked into a religious confrontation among the Jews, and he wants no part of it. So verse 15 Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. 
And so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who's called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they'd handed Jesus over to him. Now the history books tell us nothing about this custom of releasing a prisoner every Passover. We can only find that in the Bible. But all four Gospels tell the same story including John, who's believed to be independent of the other three, and so most historians agree that this is fact. Pilate is so desperate to be rid of the Jesus problem, he finds the most notorious criminal in his custody, Barabbas, and he offers to release one of the two, and he assumes the people won't want Barabbas back on the street because he's a murderer and a thief and, and, and an insurrectionist, but the people surprise him because when, when, when they choose the one to be released, they choose Barabbas, over Jesus. Verse 19. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Matthew is the only gospel that mentions this dream, this note from Pilate's wife. It's another indication that Pilate sees Jesus as an innocent man, sees no reason to condemn him. But verse 20. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who's called the Messiah, Pilate asked. And they all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. And they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that it said an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. Now, here's where the political nature of Pilate's character emerges. He believes Jesus to be innocent, but he's not interested in antagonizing the Jewish people. Now, here's good to understand the history. Remember, Sejanus, his sponsor back in Rome, is already dead. Sejanus was the one who was all for antagonizing the Jews, but now the power structure, the emperor Tiberius wants conciliation, he wants peace kept in the empire. In fact, in John's gospel, it's at this point that the Jewish religious authorities say to Pilate, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar, which would be touching right on the pressure point Pilate most felt, whether he was still to be considered a friend of Caesar or not. And so even though he doesn't believe Jesus deserves to die, he's not about to lose his job in order to protect the life of this Jewish Messiah that he doesn't care that much about in the first place. So he washes his hands. He puts the responsibility on the people. Verse 25, all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and he handed him over to be crucified. A lot of people were responsible for Jesus' death. There are the the Pharisees and the scribes who plotted against him. There's Judas who betrayed him, the high priest Caiaphas, and Herod who who, who, uh, did not stick up for him. Ultimately, you could say every person who ever lived is responsible for Jesus' death because he died for our sins. So you and I are responsible for Jesus' death in our own way. And yet it is at the command of Pilate that Jesus is taken and hung on a cross. What the Bible tells us about Pilate seems to match what the rest of history tells us about him as well. He's a political flunky who cares very little for the people he governs. But at the same time, he's not afraid to crack a few eggs in order to get an omelet made. Jesus needs to die. That's not that big a deal to him. It's better for Jesus to die than for him to lose his job. So now... So that's the story. That's Pilate. Now let me give you three reasons important that we can anchor Jesus' suffering and death in history. Three reasons again that, that the Pilate in, that excuse me that the creed insists that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. That this is a true story. First, Christianity is truth and not a fable. Knowing that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate tells us that there's more going on here than just a good story. This really happened. When I was a kid, one of my favorite toys was a little portable record player. Um, I had this 
I don't know, it was a box about a foot by a foot that would close and latch, and inside was a turntable and, and, and the arm with the needle on it and, um, and, and a cord. I could haul it wherever I wanted in the house, plug it in, and I could listen to records on it. And what I had was I had, had this box that had 64 stories in it, read-along records. Uh, it was like called the Golden Treasury of Children's Stories or something like that. And so there were, were all these stories that someone had determined that it was important for young children to know. And so it had the little engine that could, and it had Hansel and Gretel and Rumpelstiltskin and Peter Pan and that sort of thing. And I'd, I'd, I'd take the book out, and I'd take the record out and put it on my turntable, and, and, and it would start to play. And it would always begin, this is the story of the little engine that could. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know it's time to change the page when the little engine toots his horn like this. Toot, toot. And, and, and then the story would go on. And then there, every story was like that. There would be a sound effect that, you know, Rumpelstiltskin dropping coins into his bag or, or Tinkerbell sprinkling pixie dust or whatever. And, and so, so I, I listened to those records over and I basically learned to read with those read-along records. But here's the thing. In that collection of 64 stories, there were two that came from the Bible. Uh, included along with uh, Hansel and Gretel and, and uh, the Little Mermaid was uh, David and Goliath and Noah's Ark. And I didn't realize it then, but as I think about it now as an adult, as a pastor, I think, you know, that, that wasn't good. That wasn't right. Because here were all these stories that were obviously fictitious, right? Everybody knows train engines don't talk. Right? So I understood, even at five, I understood this is a made-up story. All of these made-up stories and then these two stories from the Bible presented as if they were the same. Right? Somebody somewhere decided, here are these stories that children need to learn, fables that teach good moral lessons, teach us to be brave or courageous, start to try harder. And then they included in there two stories from the Bible as if they were at the same level as these nursery rhymes from Mother Goose or, or, or Brothers Grimm. But the Bible does not present itself that way. The stories the Bible tells are not just stories. They're history. These are things that happen to real people with a real God acting in a real place and time. The Apostle Peter was one of Jesus' closest followers. Uh, one of his closest followers when Jesus was on earth, and then after Jesus went to heaven, Peter becomes the head of the church. And, and Peter wrote a couple of books that ended up in the Bible, First and Second Peter. And so in one of his letters, Second Peter, he says this. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. In other words, don't put Jesus... Don't put the story of Jesus into the same category as, as um, the little engine that could. Don't put Jesus into the same category as, as the Greek legends of Hercules or Odysseus. Don't think that this is just a product of some clever writer's imagination. Peter is an eyewitness. He saw Jesus with his own eyes. This isn't fiction. It's not a fable. And so we shouldn't think of Christianity as just one of any number of myths that we can pick and choose from. I was reading this week, it was, it was a sermon that was 20 years old. It was written right when the second wave of Star Wars movies was coming out, right? So the ones nobody wants to talk about because they weren't any good. Um, but, but, but when they were coming back out, um, some of these philosophers, again, started talking about the Star Wars myth. And they started to document the number of people who, who really were kind of living their life according to the force, right? The, that the, the mythology of Star Wars had come to influence the comic book crowd. Um, and the preacher said, keep in mind that Star Wars and the Bible do not fit in the same categories. One is obviously fiction. One is obviously a movie. One obviously sprang from the mind of George Lucas. The other is true. When the Bible presents the story of Jesus, when the Bible says Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, it wants us to understand that the story of Jesus is history. The question is whether you believe these historic events have the significance that the Bible says they have. But we shouldn't question that they're real. In fact, this leads to my second point. Christianity is not, is not a blind leap of faith. 
Knowing that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate means that we can investigate the story for ourselves. We don't have to shut our minds off. 17 years ago, the year 2000 was a presidential election year. The year 2000, that's the year George Bush was elected. George W. Bush, right? Um, and so I remember uh, one of the things that stands out to me from this presidential campaign, it was during the early round yet, the primary season, when they were kind of winnowing the field. And so there was a Republican debate. I think it took place in Iowa. A Republican debate um, where, where the question was, who is a political philosopher that's influenced you? deeply. And, and they got to George W. Bush, and, and George W. Bush's answer was Jesus, because he changed my heart. And I remember watching this live, and, and kind of, you know, I was reading a paper or whatever, and looking up and saying, that's quite an answer. Right? George W. was always pretty open about his Christianity. He was pretty open about um, how he came out of alcoholism and how Jesus changed his life. And so, so he says this right there on this national debate, and, and the moderator follows up and says, well, okay, can you explain that a little bit? And I was so disappointed with his answer. Because what he did was he kind of gave that chuckle that he became famous for, right? The one Will Ferrell made all that money off of. He kind of goes, <laughs> And then he says, well, if they don't know, it's going to be kind of hard to explain. Right? He said, Jesus changed my life. And they said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, if you don't know, it's going to be kind of hard to explain. And I was so disappointed in that answer because it sort of fits into this idea that people have that faith is something that just sort of happens to you, right? Faith is something you either have or you don't. And, and so people have this idea that, that faith, you only get it when God kind of comes along and sprinkles you with some Holy Spirit dust, and then you believe, but the Bible does not say that believing in Jesus is just a matter of blind faith. In fact, the Bible tells the story of Jesus in a way that invites us to investigate it for ourselves. Again, it's not just a fable. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. That's a verifiable fact. You can check out the sources for yourself. So take Luke, for example. Luke was a traveling companion of Paul. He was a, a doctor. Paul calls him the good physician. Um, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and then also wrote the book of Acts. And at the beginning of his Gospel, Luke tells us what he's trying to do. Here's how the Gospel of Luke begins. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. See what happens here? So Luke is saying, right here at the beginning, he's saying, look, I never met Jesus. Uh, Luke, Luke, as far as we know, never met Jesus, but, but he traveled with Paul, he heard the story of Jesus, and he decided he would check it out for himself. So he said, there are other people who've already written about Jesus. I've got copies of what they wrote right here in front of me. And there are eyewitnesses out there. There are people, most likely Mary, Peter, and others, that, that, that Luke went out and he interviewed them. And he talked to them. He said, tell me the story. And he wrote it down. And then he put it all together and wrote it in an orderly account so that we, Theophilus, which means God lovers, so that we could have it. And so it's Luke. Luke, throughout his gospel, um, makes all kinds of references to what's going on in history. It's Luke that tells us that it was a census decreed by Caesar Augustus that forced Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem so Jesus could be born. It's Luke who tells us that it's the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius that, that Jesus begins his ministry. It's basically through Luke that we know when Jesus lived, when Jesus died. And throughout his gospel, throughout the book of Acts, there are all these references to historical events and figures that mark what's happening. It's as though Luke is saying, check it out, Investigate it for yourself. This is real history. My point is, you don't have to check your brain at the door to become a Christian. Many of you, uh, after I mentioned it on Easter Sunday, went and saw the movie The Case for Christ, the story of Lee Strobel. You remember, Lee Strobel, an investigative journalist. His wife becomes a Christian. He thinks she's being silly, so he sets out to prove to her that Christianity is false. Problem is, the more he digs into it, the more he looks into the, the facts surrounding Jesus, the more he realizes that it's good history. The more he becomes convinced himself until he becomes a follower of Jesus himself. Christianity is not a leap of blind faith. 
And then third, Jesus paid it all. Knowing that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate means that Jesus' death was a real payment for our sins. Jesus' death has meaning for us. For this, we need to turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, 21 through 28. Excuse me, 23 through 28. It says, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now just pause there a minute. I sort of jumped us right into the middle of this conversation that, that, that the author of Hebrews is having about the tabernacle. And he's saying the tabernacle is an earthly representation of what's going on in heaven. The most holy place, the, this place where the high priest can only go once a year, which represents the presence of God. Everything about the temple is, is designed to show us the difficulty of approaching God. And so, so all of the things in the temple need to be sprinkled with blood to pay for our sin. The, the whole point he's saying is this is a, a replication of what's going on in heaven. It's very difficult for us to go to heaven because God is a holy God and we're sinful people. And, and, and so there's this whole system in the Old Testament of blood that, 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 that needs to purify our way. So that's what he's talking about. So again, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices... But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Verse 24, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the one true one. He entered heaven itself not to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself over and over the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. And here's the important sentence. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of the many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. See the argument here. If if the story of Jesus were just a fable, if we're just a myth, you know, a neat story that someone drew up to kind of show the power of love and sacrifice and that sort of thing, well, then, then that story, that, that, that myth has to be told over and over again. Jesus has to be sacrificed over and over again, just like the high priest went in year by year to offer sheep and goats. But verse 26 says he appeared once for all. At the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Because Jesus appeared in history... Because Jesus was a real person who lived in a real place at a definite time in the story of creation, because he suffered under Pontius Pilate, which is a verifiable fact in history, then his death was sufficient to do away with sin once for all. It's not just a nice story. Jesus, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit so that he's fully God, perfect in every way, born of the Virgin Mary so he's fully human, able to stand in for the rest of us, flesh and blood, Jesus really suffered. Jesus was really crucified, died, and was buried. It all happened. And when he died, his sacrifice did something. The sacrifice of millions upon millions of sheep and goats could never do. It did away with sin. See, it's transactional. We understand that there's a holy God who demands justice in his universe. And that means sin has to be paid for. It ha- there has to be an accounting. And we understand that we are sinful, that we all owe a debt to God. There has to be a transaction. And in the death of Jesus, that transaction takes place. So we never have to wonder if our sins have really been paid for. We never have to wonder if the debt has been fully paid. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Jesus was sacrificed once for all to take away the sins of many people. It's a verifiable fact of history. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, Lord, as we come to the part of the creed that really talks about your sacrifice for us, your mission for coming to earth. Um, we thank you for this truth that, that there's good, reliable evidence that this happened, that you truly paid off our debt, that you truly um, shed your blood for our sins.
It's not just a story. It's not just a fable. It's not just a blind leap of faith, but we can investigate the story for ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that you stood before Pilate, and when you could have found words to say that would have, let, would have forced him to let you go, you, you allowed yourself to be taken and crucified because you knew only in that way could you pay our debt. We thank you for that, for your grace to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Starting Tuesday, uh, all through this week, uh, we have opportunities for you to come cut, paste, paint, uh, tape, 
lift, saw, whatever. Um, so, and uh, do also be praying for Vacation Bible School as we get ready for it as it starts next Monday. Our registration is full. We have um, 250, 260 kids through fifth grade, and then we have like another 120 middle schoolers who will be here helping in various ways. So um, it's a, quite a week, so we do covet your prayers as well. As you uh, go, um, may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.